excellent interview with my favorite couple, the Byersons. Uh, they delivered exactly like we thought they would. And uh, they had a good time. I think they are going to get back on their show and do their thing. And hopefully they invite me on there. If not, if not, it's going to be some problems. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we're back with the break. Don McKay is here. You can follow him on uh, RadioOnFire.com every morning. I mean, every morning, seven days a week. This guy's here, live morning show, 9 a.m. I mean, he's one of the hardest working guys in the game, and I, I always say I appreciate him for giving me uh, a vessel to then give other people a vessel to say different things. So that brings me today to my next guest, a good friend of mine, visionary, um, hardworking person, uh, very nice lady with with a vision and a goal, uh, attorney, hello. Hello. Miss Amy Lynn Wilson. How you doing, Amy? I'm good. How are you? Amy's here. And... uh we're here to talk about Inside Out, which is an organization that Amy had a major part in starting. Um, Amy, you're a, a public defense attorney, right? Public defender? Correct. And uh, who is Amy? I mean, what what is being a public defender? I mean, you're, you're down there in the courthouse. I've been there. I know it's, it's a madhouse. Yeah. It is literally a madhouse. Yeah. And you have to go there every day and people are trying to scream at you and, and, and yeah, I mean, who is Amy, first of all, and why are you doing what you're doing? Okay. Well, I've been a public defender now for 20 years. Ooh. I've been representing kids in Baltimore city for the past 17 years mm -hmm. and I love my job. Mm -hmm. um, that madhouse you describe is what makes my job interesting and fun. I meet new people every day and I get, be their voice in court. So I love and, my job. And when you say you represent kids, you're representing children or youth that are um, possibly going to be adjudicated, maybe have committed crimes, allegedly. Right. They allegedly. all allegedly committed crimes. <laughs> allegedly, right. Allegedly, we have some badass kids and Amy is out there representing them. Right. I mean, so with that said, I mean, seeing a city of violence, 200 murders, a lot of these kids, they aren't saints. We both know. Yeah. Um, how and I and I actually even saw you um, talking to someone uh, on your Facebook. I didn't read the commentary, uh -huh. but they asked you, "How do you do that? How do how do you get up to work every day, knowing that you have to look at this person and see the good that everyone else doesn't see?" Well, everybody has good in them, mm -hmm. and. I try to look at the bigger picture, even though a lot of my kids have done a lot of really bad things. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the system as a whole, and it's my job to put those checks in place so that the police and the prosecutors and the man doesn't roll over on everybody. <laughs> the man. You know, I mean, you, that's genera you generationally uh, gave yourself away on that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you know, it's about making sure that people you know, follow the law and do things properly and don't railroad people. Because in mm. my opinion, it's better to see many guilty people go free than to see one innocent person spend time in prison. Mm. I, I just can't think of anything more frustrating than to be in prison for something you didn't do. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. So, I mean, what, what motivates you to, to go down this road? I mean, most, most people, when you think of law school, like where did you where did you get your degree, by the way? University of Maryland. University of Maryland. I wanted to go. I wanted to do the dual program. I think we talked about that. Yeah. I mean, a prestigious university, in my opinion, um, named after prestigious great man, um, also my fraternity brother. What what would would motivate someone to get a degree from there, spend all of those hours to be a public defender? I was that kid that wouldn't stand up to say the Pledge of Allegiance in school because of the line and for justice for all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I knew that there was no justice for all at a very early age. Mm -hmm. And I just I knew that the criminal justice system was broken and I wanted to be a part of trying to fix it. Mm -hmm. Now, I know, obviously, that there's a lot more to be fixed than I can do, but I feel like I can help in any little way that I can. So. And where did, where did you grow up? I grew up in Columbia. And, yeah, and 
a lot of people assume that to be in this business, you have to have some personal way of relating, mm -hmm. but I don't. I mean, if I'm honest, I had a very ideal upbringing, but what I know is that in spite of my ideal upbringing, I still found rebellion mm -hmm. and I still found a way mm -hmm. to get into trouble in spite of mm -hmm. the best parents and the best neighborhood and best schools and all this stuff. So. I've always thought to myself that if I could find my way into rebellion, imagine mm -hmm. what these kids have to contend with. And so I just I have a lot of empathy for my clients. And I Re agree Realistically, you yeah. relate more than than maybe the average person. I mean, just because, you know, you grew up somewhere that isn't like most of your clients, trouble finds anybody, anywhere, anytime. Yes. And I mean, you know, you were kind of alluding to just now that you might have been a little troublemaking yeah. a little a trouble bit. starter so i mean <laughs> I, I guess that that you relate in that sense to me a lot more than you you might really let on or really understand and 20 years i mean 20 years you've been doing this have you seen a, a shift or a change in the culture of what you do and oh, the people that you serve absolutely how so um when i first started practicing most of my clients were coming in for um, drug dealing. They were standing on the corner all day hustling. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot more cases back then. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. has happened over time is I have fewer cases. The number of arrests has actually gone down, but the kind of cases I have are a lot more serious. Wow. Um, How so? A lot, a lot more violence. Mm -hmm. um, is, you know, instead of, you know, distribution of drugs, it's carjacking or armed robbery or something. Something of that nature. So it's changed a and, lot. And, and how does that affect your, your psyche when, I mean, because I, I, I tell you, you know, um, I come from the social work realm. I spent a lot of time in the building um, that we both are very familiar with. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm physically bigger than you, mm -hmm. you know, so my relationship with my clients was a lot different, in my opinion. Um, and I know to some degree, you know, our clients will look at the attorney a little bit different as well, too. But how is what kind of mindset is that for you when you're standing next to someone mm -hmm. who's been accused of possibly some of the most heinous things you've ever heard? How do you stay focused with that? It's hard for me sometimes to believe that the person I'm standing next to and that I'm talking to is the same person I'm reading about on paper mm -hmm. because I get to know another side of them. So, you know, sometimes it's quite shocking for me to even imagine these people doing these things um, because I get to know them on a whole nother level. So and you, and you get to know what kind of makes them tick, what, what kind of might have made them uh, even be qualified to be in the position they're in. Yeah. So, I mean, with that said, uh, you kind of told me a little bit about, well, I know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, but everyone else doesn't. So you have a nonprofit now. You're a part of a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um, I won't speak, you know, out of turn, but you're a part of a nonprofit organization here, founded on the ground in Baltimore, Maryland, called Inside Out. Yep. Tell us about Inside Out. Well, Inside Out is a program unlike any other program in this area, and it's designed specifically to deal with the issues that uh, kids and family members of incarcerated individuals face. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I've noticed over the 20 years that I've been practicing is that more and more of my clients have parents that have been in and out of prison. Mm -hmm. And I think, unfortunately, it's gotten to the point where it's so common that even the professionals in the business underestimate the impact that it has on these kids. Um, and all along, I've been coming in contact with kids that were angry or rebellious or, you know, exhibiting the symptoms of this in so many different ways. And they would deal with it in ways that were completely inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking around to find a program that would deal with this particular issue and realized there were none. So I said, well, I'm going to have to start this program. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's how most grassroots, grassroots uh, nonprofit organizations start. They start with the need. And you talked about because um, my earlier guest Danny is a is a teacher, and I'm sure she's come across um, children maybe that she may or may not know have been in this predicament. But basically, in, in in simplicity, you're talking about children being born into a life or 
They're living in a life in which their parents, male or female, mm -hmm. are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. They're dealing with the absence of that parent mm -hmm. in an environment that is is not soft for those that have parents. Mm -hmm. And they're dealing with not having parents. Um, the societal and local cultural stigma that comes along with mm -hmm. having parents that are incarcerated and the trajectory. Right. So you're talking about an organization that is looking to what are the, what is the effect? What are the, what are the impacts? We know that statistically, if you have parents that are incarcerated, there's a higher chance that you might follow down the same path, mm -hmm. but no one was really looking to why that happens and what we can do about that. Is that what virtually inside out is about? Well, yeah, but it's even more than that. Um, having an incarcerated parent affects a child's mental health, physical mm -hmm. health, mm -hmm. um, behavioral health. I mean, it affects them in so many different ways. And I think, unfortunately, people don't make the connection between these symptoms and the fact that the parent is incarcerated. Um, kids who are incarcerated have higher rates of ADHD, depression, anxiety. They don't eat as nutritiously. They have higher rates of um, diabetes and blood pressure problems and they um, higher rates of truancy in school and mm -hmm. dropout rates. Um, there's so many different ways in which they're impacted and a lot of people just aren't making that connection. And what they'll do is they'll just treat it as typical teenage rebellion mm -hmm. and they'll try to fix it in ways that don't get to the issue. Like if a kid is um, skipping school, they think, well, let's stick an electronic monitor on his ankle and monitor his whereabouts and, you know, he'll start to straighten out. It doesn't work. And then they're all scratching their heads wondering, what well, what do we do? Right. You know, or, um, you know, if a kid is angry, they'll send them to an anger management group, you know, where they teach them how to, you know, walk away when there's a conflict or count to 10 or whatever, but they don't deal with why they're angry. Mm -hmm. So... And Inside Out virtually, what services does Inside Out provide? Well, Inside Out treats the issue like the trauma that it actually is. And so we provide trauma-informed therapy to the children and the family members because when a child is impacted, so is their family. Absolutely. And if the family doesn't have the appropriate therapy, um, then they can't support the child. So yeah. they have to be treated as a whole. Holistic, holistic treatment. Right. So holistic treatment. Yeah. But the, the child has to be treated individually too. They have to be able to communicate about those issues and how they impact them separate from the family. So that's Absolutely. why we do the individual and family therapy. And and how how did Inside Out get started and how young is it and where is it now? Well, it's brand new. Um, we just started at the beginning of this year and we're in the phase now where we're starting to get out there and let people know we exist. So right. we're really just getting off the ground. And it started one day in the courthouse when I went to, um, we have a, an office in the building where kids go for drug screening. Mm. And uh, me and one of the addictions counselors were sitting around talking about how many of the clients that we see have parents that are incarcerated. And we were both kind of lamenting the fact that there were no programs to deal with it. Mm. You know, and we jokingly looked at each other and said, well, we should start a program, but neither one of us had the means to do it. So then we finally pulled in a third partner and the program was born. Absolutely. And you guys are, are at a very young stage, mm -hmm. um, ensuring that we get, you know, the name out there because, you know, as a professional, um, I think you touched on it gingerly. Um, and I understand why that, you know, professionals are getting uh, jaded mm -hmm. to the sense that, you know, they lose faith in what the youth are capable of, um, how to treat it, how to help. And I'll be honest, you know, after you've seen 40 or 50 kids cycle through, um, because, I mean, I, I in, in the stage that you work with them, um, and, I, and I think you might be an exception to the rule because I don't. I, I think that you might have a deeper connection, but in the stage that typically a lot of uh, the people in your position might work with these kids, you do what you do, they go, and then they go back in the community and you may see them again. Mm -hmm. um, people like me, we get them when they come back yeah. and I have to work with integrating them and integrating them back into society as a social worker, things like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it gets a little, you get a little jaded. 
mm-hmm. and you you get a little tired and it gets monotonous. And so I, I think what you said was very important. I think even going through the journey that you're going to go through is very important for everyone involved to keep at the forefront that every 30 kids that you may help, only one may actually show what we see mm-hmm. as an improvement because I think every child um, improves in their own way or does their own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, So, I mean, I definitely commend you in doing that. Well, thank you. But, you know, um, the Public Defender's Office has implemented what we call vertical representation. What's vertical representation? So vertical representation means if a kid gets into trouble and I'm assigned to as his lawyer, they come back to you. Come back to you. So anytime. How old is that? How um, how, How new is that? Well, the juvenile division has been doing it forever. Wow. Um, the adult system has just started doing it. But okay. um, so I get to know my clients pretty well and their but families. That, but 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 the key thing about that is accountability, mm-hmm. because you can't if you're a professional that cares about their reputation, you can't just do whatever for whatever and not have this person stick with you. Mm-hmm. I think I think that's brilliant. I think that's genius. I don't I don't know how taxing that is on you guys. Like as is that taxing? I mean, I think it's an exception, but is that taxing for some of your counterparts? I, n- well, no. I think it's actually easier because you get to know your client better, and it makes yeah. your job easier. How so? Um, I know my client well enough to know what arguments to make on his behalf and what things to stay away from. <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay. I mean, it's just. When you know your client better, you're going to represent them better all the way around. But what, but what about that feeling? Okay, okay, EJ, you know, and you're talking to me, you know, this is my fourth or fifth car. Because I'll be honest, you know, uh, at a certain point in my life, you might, you might have had this conversation with me if I didn't got caught. Yeah. Um, this is your fourth or fifth car. What the hell are you doing? What, what, what is, what's going on? I mean, what does that ever play a role on you to say, like, dude, like, why are we here with this shit again? I can understand why you're coming from that perspective because of what you do. But (laughs) my job isn't to fix the kid. Okay. You know what I mean? I have a very different role in the process. Okay. So my job is simply to know, you know. What are the facts? Yeah, what arguments to make as to what would benefit him, what would not benefit him. You know. Get him in get him in the best best possible situation. I mean and I and I think they they kinda coincide to the point where it's like, no matter what, we have a job to do. Right. That's a fact. We have a job to do. And I mean I had that conversation, you know, with with, with you that I work with outside of work. You know, I, I'm very straightforward. Like what what the hell are you doing? Yeah. You know, because I have to. Right. You know, it's, it's my social responsibility. It's not my professional responsibility, it's my social responsibility. But I mean, that's that's interesting. You know, that's an interesting take on it, and I like that. Um, so, well, I mean, I get, when I see a client come in repeatedly, I will say to them, "Look, you're that's right? what I that's what I want to hear." That's <laughs> no, what I want to hear. No, I mean, I, I'll, I'll say to them, "Look, every time you come back, my job gets a little bit harder." Right. Exactly. You know, and we, so we have that conversation, but at the end of the day, I'm not the one that's tasked with you know making. Yeah, but but I but it does it ever weigh on you? Does it ever take a toll? Does it ever like are you? There's some days you just need to go ahead and just walk away and come back. Yeah. I've had those moments. I had a moment in court once when I couldn't get the words out and I said, Your Honor, I need a moment. And I went out in the hallway and I took a deep breath and I came back because one of my favorite clients had found himself in some really serious trouble and I was seriously disappointed. Wow. And yeah, it took me a minute. (laughs) That and that's kind of like you kind of got like the parent role because if no one else can advocate for you, it should be your your parents and you've kind of taken that role, whether you know it or not, mm-hmm. you're kind of the last line of defense Yeah. for a lot of these kids. Yeah. So, I mean, with everything, switching gears, I mean, definitely want to highlight Inside Out, um, www.insideoutbalt.org. Uh, put that in my Facebook status. That is a website. Uh, referrals and information, just how to support, go there. Um, and there is a Facebook page. Mm-hmm. There is a Facebook page. Is it, what's a Facebook page? I can't think of it off top. It's Inside Out. Inside Out. Oh, I think. I yeah. think so, too. Yeah, so and too. we have a Twitter page. And... I'm not on Twitter anymore. I need to get back on Twitter. Oh, okay. But I'm afraid to get back on Twitter. But that's a whole <laughs> other comment. A whole other conversation. Um, you've been 
in the city for 20 years mm-hmm. and really quickly i mean where do you be- what do you believe it's not really quickly but what do you believe we can begin to do to fix our juvenile problems that's a tough one because it's way bigger than the juvenile court it's i mean it goes back to the crime bill <laughs> so the we're crime talking bill are you talking about the mandatory minimum is one of them bill or? clinton mandatory minimums oh, yeah, 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 yeah. um you yeah. know repeat offender laws yeah. all that sort of thing yeah. and you know like i said earlier it, that has affected the number of clients that i see whose parents are incarcerated mm. so it's a way bigger problem you know it is deeper than than what we are facing today the mandatory minimums i mean i can tell you just from um a social level and i think me and diamond k talked about this before you know the the removal because this it's always been crime right mm-hmm. um and like diamond k talked about it i talked about it last show or one of the shows that we had that mandatory minimum there are people serving time for 20 plus years for selling marijuana mm-hmm. where in colorado california they would have been millionaire tycoons. Yeah. Somebody like me would have had a CEO position. <laughs> yeah. For the things that I was doing. Yeah. I'd have had a CEO position. Yeah. Just buying cigarettes and, and, and all of that good stuff. I'd have been up there. And it has had an adverse effect because when I look at the kids on the corner, I look at who's in the middle. Mm-hmm. That like the, the the street person in me looks at who is everybody around. Mm-hmm. And I look at that person, they're the same age as everybody around. Mm-hmm. When I was growing up, it was usually the tallest, biggest, ugliest, scariest, oldest dude mm-hmm. that had the wisdom that people listened to and they followed a path. And I think you're touching on something that we've kind of talked about and everybody kind of comes back to it. It's no real guidance. It's no one to really tell somebody not to do something different. Mm-hmm. Dominic, okay, you got something? It's, I do. It's, I, have, I have a question. Uh, so if, if mandatory minimums were... Um, equally uh, levy across the board, right? We, we got to be specific not just, about, just, gotta be not specific just, about just which ones. Proportionately. You got to be specific about which ones, too. Uh, let's say drug offenses. Okay. Let's say that that was across the board. Uh, with I'm talking about culturally? Culturally. Mm-hmm. Do you think that it would have been a good idea then? Is it is it the part that um, some offenses that may affect people in the urban communities uh, kind of get hit harder with sentencing. Is that the part that 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 uh, that y'all have the issue with? I mean, because I think it's supposed to be a deterrent, right? Yes. It's supposed to be it, when I'm sure when they created it, somebody was thinking, okay, if people know that this is what you're facing, this is gonna work. This is this is this is what you're dealing with. If you, if you go here, you know, and, and then that would be the deterrent. I think Amy touched on it to a part of what she does. And then when you look at the city, you know, making sure things are fair, I think to your point, well, one thing that we know is for sure, one thing's for certain, right? The laws, the way they're written, are supposed to apply to everybody. Mm-hmm. But we know, statistically, um, societally, they haven't all been applied. Mm-hmm. So I think to your point, that is the problem. Systemically, you know, um, the ounce of, and even when you're talking about crack, versus cocaine and the different things. I mean, even when we talked about becoming a police officer and the marijuana, the, these things are systemically written. So I'm saying, so it's not the cultures. law, it's the application. Is that what you're saying? I, I would say it's a bit of both. I would say it's a bit of both. I think there's a lot to it. There's the racial bias in policing. There's the, um, the sentencing biasing i mean i think the problem is when you take away the discretion that the judges have it also doesn't give a person an incentive to better themselves when they're in prison they've taken all the good programs out of prisons you can't get as many skills in prison you can't get as much of an education in prison as you used to be able to do and um the the ban the box initiative i think was a step in the right direction but when you um lock somebody away and cut them off from society for so long and you don't give them what they need to reintegrate themselves once they get out and you put up all those barriers, what are they going to do? Of course they're going to end up back in trouble again. And I think we need to do a better job of making sure that people have something they can do once they get out of prison and that we don't throw up obstacles in their way. 
So, I mean, there's so many aspects of it, but you know, studies show that white people are as just as guilty as using drugs as black people, but it's the black people that get in trouble more often. It's because of the policing. So there's just so many different aspects to it. Yeah, that's the that's the missing piece that I did. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 just you just quelled DK's fire because he yeah. he was hot there. He was hot. There. I set it up so she could knock it down. That's he, what I did. He, de- he yeah. definitely was hot there, yeah. and you definitely touched on it. And uh, I mean, you talked about it. I mean, it's an important aspect because it's twofold. I mean, I'll be honest. You know, me me and Diamond K talked about it. You know, with the mandatory minimum for the gun thing. Mm-hmm. I mean. I'm, I mean, New York implemented it at one point, and I remember people literally having conversations thinking about shooting somebody. Yeah. And they were like, nah, we're not going to shoot we gonna Was that under Giuliani? Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it was like, it was like we're not going to shoot him. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. You know, you thought about it. You, you had that sense. You had the deterrence. But I also say today's generation is a lot... Uh, less, a lot more fearless yeah. than any other generation before. See, I disagree with you in that it has a deterrent effect. I don't think I'm it's... I'm speaking to yeah. what it did for me, my generation. Right. Well, what I, you see today, I don't, I don't yeah. think it does. I think when people commit a crime, they're not thinking they're going to get caught. Mm-hmm. I think that's why the death penalty doesn't have a deterrent effect on murder. You know, I just, I don't see it as a deterrent effect at all. And I think we need to focus more on rehabilitating people than we do on the deterrence aspect of it, because I don't think it works. Well, then the other thing is there's a deterrence aspect in in the rehabilitation part is almost the the end result, too. We also need to put more money into the deterrence of the circumstances that cause the the illegal activity in the first place. You mean poverty? Poverty. Yeah. I was just gonna say we right. we're in a we're in a national administration that the first thing they cut is our jobs. Mm-hmm. They cut the social services. They cut the the programs. They cut the different things. Um, even when you're looking at social services and and uh, the displacement of the family. So I mean, it's it's a number of different things that go into it. Um, so you're absolutely right. I mean, I was speaking. I was speaking from a sense that at that moment, mm-hmm. people in New York City knew that they weren't playing. Mm-hmm. But I will say, this generation is is the most fearless generation I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. They and you got to think about it. We, I remember when nine eleven happened. I remember when um, we didn't know what was going on. We, I was there. We were in New York. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't have access to social media. Mm-hmm. We didn't know what was going on until hours and hours later. Right. And it didn't hit us that way. So we were still a generation that was sensitized. Um, you know, people that experienced the Vietnam War heard it on radio. Mm-hmm. Some people might have saw some propaganda on TV. Mm-hmm. But now these children are able to see everything. They're mm-hmm. desensitized to everything. They really are fearless. And like you said, I don't know if it would be a deterrent. Uh, we definitely did, definitely need the rehab aspect. But we definitely need the preventive active, uh, action, too, to not let them get there. Right. There's another aspect, though, that I'm not sure that we can do anything about mm. other than maybe gun control, and that is all the retaliatory violence that yeah. we see in the city. Yeah. Yeah. You know, somebody shoots somebody, and then somebody in their family shoot somebody in return and it goes back and forth, back and, and forth ends. like the Hatfield and the McCoys. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Did you say, I think you said something about that recently. Did you say that on Facebook? Uh-huh. Somebody did. Somebody definitely talked about that. And uh-huh. um, we talked, me and Nami K talked about that on one show, but I think I was, I posted on Facebook about it. Systemically, the ATF that should be tasked with search and seizure for illegal guns is one of the only government agencies that in 20 plus years, has not grown in size, intel, or technology. Mm-hmm. So this is a systemic problem with that. Yeah. The Just, easy access to guns and the fact that nobody in the street trusts the police enough to solve those crimes before the retaliation right, occurs. Right. So, you know, that's a community policing issue. Absolutely. Again, another aspect of the problem. Absolutely. But, yeah, I mean, I have state's attorneys say to me all the time, won't your client please tell us who, you know, Mm-hmm. Blah, blah, blah. And I have to say to them, no, because the the threat of retaliation is real. And if they do it, they're putting their lives at risk. I mean, I, I have these two clients that were, they're twins. And I represented them for years before 
one of them got killed and it was the one that I was least likely to think would get killed. Honestly, he was never in really any trouble um, of a serious kind. He got killed. His brother shot the person who killed his twin and now he's in prison. And me, meanwhile, over the years that I was representing these two, every time we'd come to court, either they'd be bringing mom from the back or dad from the back, meaning being that they were locked up themselves, right? Handcuff and shackles. Yep. So yep. it's, you know, it's just one of those the, things. The, that, the fact that you, the fact that you even use the terminology from the back, jogs my memories of being in that courtroom and saying, mm -hmm. you know how when when the van is late, and mm -hmm. somehow I never understand this. <laughs> how the hell the van is late? And it's like, how you know? It's you're like, right down the road. You're right, right down the road. It's <laughs> like we're waiting for mom to come back from the back. They have a guy that is that's yo that is serious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't that's know serious. what y'all was talking about. Y'all was using slang terms. We were definitely using. I mean, because if you've ever been in this courtroom, what whatever the case is, whatever's going on, when it's juveniles and uh, when a youth or adolescents in, involved, and their parents are locked up, and it's like the the bailiff will say, "Oh, you know, I'm sorry, judge. It's taking a little while. We got to get their parents from the back." Mm -hmm. When she said that, I immediately. My mind automatically went there. I was like, yeah. "Damn, I remember that." I mean, because you, you. So, like, what's the up? judge's I, response to that that statement? The master or the judge? I've seen some of them. Uh, I mean, literally with this shit again. Like I've that kind of expression like, yeah. with this shit again, or I'm, I'll be back. Call Is it like a recess that happens or something? You, you might have somebody that'll be like, "I call me when they come back." So, because <laughs> that the parent has to be present, even. For yeah, whatever the circumstances, circumstances yeah. for whatever it might have been. Yeah. It, it really depends on the yeah. magistrate or the judge because yeah. some of them will ask the kid, you want your parent here? Others will just insist, you know, yeah. so it depends. It all depends on the circumstance. And, and, and sometimes, you know, depending on what it is, you know, it's already been prearranged or mm -hmm. whatever it is. But, I mean, when you said that, that literally took me back. I was like, wow. And it's serious. It's real. I don't think people... Everyday people, I don't think they know the intricacies of what's sure, going on. I'm sure they don't. Mm -hmm. I really don't. The thing that always um, shocks me, though, still to this day, is when they bring a parent in from prison, and the parent is standing, sitting in the chair with you know their hands cuffed Shack, around their yeah. waist and their feet shackled together, and the guard standing behind them, and they proceed to lecture their child about getting in trouble, and I'm like thinking to myself, I'm wondering how this child is receiving this, you know, seeing that they made the very mistakes that they're trying to keep yeah. them from making, you know, it's just, I, I wonder if they're thinking, well, you know, you have a right to talk, you have no credibility in my opinion, or are they thinking, oh, I better listen because you really know. I just, I don't know. I go back and forth on that particular yeah, I issue. That. Yeah. I think it's a case, I think it's a case by case thing. You know, I've had, I've had youth that you know, have seen that for the first time, and that was all I needed to see. I've had youth that have seen that and said, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think it's a case-by-case case thing. Like I always say, and I need to coin this somehow, you know, we're working with people. We're not working with cops. Mm -hmm. You know, everything's not an assembly line fix. Right. So everybody's different, but it, it is very interesting. It is very real. It, it mm -hmm. is very disheartening. It really mm -hmm. is. So, I mean, I always commend people that are, are in there. But switching gears, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I saw your, your thoughts recently on this, and I asked the Byersons about this. What are your thoughts on 45 and Charlottesville? <laughs> you want to get me started on this? Go ahead. Right, I want to huh? get you started. We are, we are going to live in here. I want to get you started. Okay. Well, I was very disappointed by his press conference on you Tuesday. Can, you can be as frank as you want to be here. Yeah. This show is live, direct. We are not a family. Okay. Wholesome environment. We say what the hell we want. Here. All right. Let's put it this way. I wasn't a bit surprised. I've known the man was a racist ever since he took out a full page ad wanting, you know, wanting the death penalty for the Central Park Five. 100%. Right. So, uh, you know, when I, That's been a while. that was a while back, that was long before Ooh. he decided to run for president. And then he just confirmed it with the whole birther thing with Obama. And, you know, I mean, there was nowhere along the way that he, he was didn't talking make about your Obama. He, he was talking about your Obama. If, Obama. if there was ever, <laughs> I've uh, argued with many callers in the past about this. So some people told me that Trump 
prior to this, had never done anything racist. Uh, it was, he was not a racist. Um, and, and so, you know, they, when I cited the, the Central Park uh, Five incident, uh, they kind of, you know, kind of shrugged it off. It's not, it didn't, even the birthing thing, but there's no denying uh, now. Right. Oh, they will oh, try. No. They will well, try. Before oh. then, he got sued for discrimination in his housing. It is, so. That's yep. true. Yep. That that is true. hiring practice. That's true. Right. I mean, it, there's never been a point in time where he hasn't behaved like a racist. So yeah. what else do we? His father. Him? His father was a Klansman. A Klansman. Yeah. His father was a Klansman, and Doc, uh, it's document. Unfortunately, yes. I like to say Trump is the biggest hustler from New York City. Um, he, he uh, he's bigger he's than from Queens. He's from Queens, unfortunately. Okay. Um, but New York is an extremely racist place, extremely still segregated place, um, more than a lot of places. I mean, just I, I don't even know. I mean, my Staten Island people have to tell me, but they were having race wars in the two thousands. I mean, in the two thousands, in the two thousands, literally, like if I was black, I was in the wrong neighborhood in Staten Island, like a Bronx Tale. Yeah, literally, okay. literally the same way Bronx Tale was in the. Being portrayed that was like the fifties. In the fifties, it was being portrayed in the fifties that way, and that was a part of the Bronx. I think well, they they weren't true to the culture of because I'm thinking about exactly where it was shot. It was shot in the West Bronx, but in the Bronx there were places like South Bronx. If you weren't Puerto Rican or black or certain blocks, or even here south of Baltimore Street, north of Baltimore Street, whatever it was. But literally in Staten Island in the two thousands, and I and I if I had somebody, I mean I know somebody I can call right now. Literally, if you're in the wrong neighborhood, you were getting beat down. Mm-hmm. Literally, you're gonna fight your way out. I mean, discuss. Literally. So, um, I said to say, you know, New York is very racist um, mm-hmm. in ideal and ideology. And I like the joke though that Donald Trump is the biggest hustler from New York. He mm-hmm. he, he got the world behind. Him, he got the country behind him. He got fifty percent of white women to vote for him, even though he's the biggest misogynist okay. in the world. That was I. I and I talked to some women um, after the election that said under no circumstances would they vote for a woman um, uh, president. Mm. They just Why? they were just they just felt that a woman could not lead, and these were women, and that was so so surprising to me. I'm just I'm thinking that they were going to completely recognize that Hillary you, was you know why more you know why, and I'm going to use Amy as bait. And I could be wrong, <laughs> but I'm going out on a limb. Amy, how many female friends do you hang out with? I mean, I keep my circle tight, but... Amy. What? Counselor. <laughs> how many female <laughs> friends right now, if you were to go have a drink, how many of them would you call? A handful. So that's like five. Yeah. I'm, counselor, I need yeah. you to be specific. Yeah. I got on speed dial like four or five people. Now... There is that's more than the average. There is that is, <laughs> but there is a biological, natural distrust with the woman. I used to only believe that culturally it was. Is that true? Um, I believe so. I disagree. I, I'm going with it. <laughs> I'm going with it. That's that's my sexist thing to say. What is that? Why do you why do you say that? Because I just see it. I see it all the time. Doesn't matter the culture. Doesn't matter the ethnicity. Doesn't matter the profession. There's just something about women, and there's a dominance, and there's an element. Uh, and with, I, I feel like this, like, I always tell guys, if there were no women, we'd walk around in drawers, flip-flops, no cuts, <laughs> no showers, no nothing. But women, you guys get dressed. Well, some, I, 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 I you are, you're, you're different. So I kind of give you a pass because you, I don't know you that well, uh-huh. but you always give me a different feeling. But there are women that no matter what, they have to outdo the other woman. See, I look at it more as not as a mistrust between women, but as a um, l- lack of confidence in themselves. Very true. I, I think that women have been told over and over again that they're second to men in every sort of way. They can't hold mm. positions of power. They can't be the one in charge. They, you know, it's subservient to men in a lot of ways. And so they just don't have the confidence in women in to general. believe in that Hillary to believe. Right. But I mean, it, that essentially, that was another angle of it. I was going mm-hmm. in a different angle of it. Yeah. But not to, not to digress too much from my original point, Trump, I know you don't like him. Um, it's an understatement. I'm giving you that. <laughs> Charlottesville. Yeah. 
I saw you post, and I don't, I don't want to put you in a spot, but I will. Go ahead. You talked about Charlottesville in your perspective. Being a white person, uh, of the white eth ethnicity and culture, because I white persuasion, <laughs> white persuasion. <laughs> you you are dating yourself a little bit because you're That's saying okay. things that are old school persuasion in the man <laughs> are things that are no longer popular culture. Oh, how do you feel about that? Like, how do you feel about Charlottesville? How do you feel about the whole thing? What are your thoughts? Well, I'm sick of people making excuses and saying it was about the statues. <clears throat> Because it wasn't about the statues. I, I mean, I disagree that if if for some reason I had an attachment to the statues and really felt the belief that they needed to remain for history's sake, and I disagree with that perspective, that's another story. But if I if that was my position and I went down there and I saw nothing but KKK and people chanting racist slogans, I'd say, mm, time to go home. Right. I would not march alongside people that had that message, no matter what my purpose was in being there. So virtually, even if even if you d you're, you don't you don't have any attachment to this to the statue, but even if you did, and you saw what was going on, you as a decent human being, no matter what, would have removed yourself. Right. So when Donald Trump said there were fine people on both sides, I was yeah. thought to myself, who's he kidding? Right. Who, what fine person is going to march alongside these people? They just wouldn't. Right. I mean, it, like they say, you lay down with dogs, you get fleas. And that's pretty much, <laughs> you know, the mentality I have over that situation. I don't think there are any fine people in there. I think that anybody who marched along with them can be assumed to be a racist. Absolutely. Can be, I mean, and you're talking as a, as a, as a legal person, but we're not gonna can be assumed you're a damn racist. Yeah. If if you're a nationalist, anything, and all of that, you're a racist. And I've said it for years that it doesn't surprise me, and it pisses me off because the fact that these organizations have been given legal status in this country, that's the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. America, as we were saying in the in the show in a, um in a segment prior, my thing has always been. If the Ku Klux Klan is still allowed to operate in this nation, that's the fundamental problem. They are the oldest form of terrorism that maybe arguably that this world has ever seen. Mm -hmm. Arguably that this world has ever seen. Because religious, there's always been religious persecution. There's always been religious wars. There's always been religious battles. But their tactics, their practice, their, their discretion, their, their ways about doing things, everything that ISIS, Al Qaeda, Al whatever, I'll be sure, whatever that they have ever done, they have been on record to say they borrowed it from the white terrorist organizations mm -hmm. in this country. And until we outlaw what they stand for, who they are, I mean, it also amazes me that a group like the Hells Angels, with the, his the vile history of drugs, racism, prejudice, still is incorporated to this day. How do we combat that? Amy? Well, the problem is you're really treading on the freedom of speech aspect of it. And I, look, I know that's frustrating, but until it it morphs from um, freedom of expression into an actual physical crime, there's nothing we can but do we, about but it. But we have that evidence. And I mean, this, this goes back to the difference of and the racial inequality. We have people that, that suffer that go to Guantanamo Bay that suffer from these these uh, religious stigmas and things like that, they don't even get a chance. Mm -hmm. These people have documented history, documented, documented, or documented history of why they should be persecuted. And I think it does goes back it does go back to what we're holding our congressmen and, and, and who's and the other problem is too, we can't identify these people. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys that were out here with the tiki torches. <laughs> you able to identify them. Yeah, I was gonna say they're monitoring these groups, but yeah. unfortunately until they, you know I mean, I, I have a question for for some of what you said. And I and I've heard people say that. I think that uh, many of them were there for the statues. Uh, the the racist you groups. Being, you being lighthearted. Because yeah. because because of the symbolism of it. Mm, because in absolutely. their minds the re, you know the reason for the you not replace us and, and all that kind of uh, stupid chance that they were doing 
is because the symbols of the statues to them uh, signifies just the tearing down of something else. I just I don't understand how uh, they have that mentality. The statue itself is is not I guess you know the like tolerance for things that they don't particularly these small groups don't particularly care for. So I think that the statues were symbolic for them. Uh, from the historical standpoint, it's not like they really valued the statue or or Tammy or Lee or any of the people. <laughs> it's more so the what representation absolutely of it, and they're just using that as the you know the basis for the hate. I think the statue is like the bait, and that's how they hook yeah. them and then pull them yes, into yes. The, the larger mentality. Yes. But I mean, if we think about it, a statue is supposed to celebrate something. And Very you, good point. I mean, good point. really, Very good you want to celebrate somebody who was trying to secede from this nation, somebody who's a traitor, a, complete, a traitor, sure. treasonous, yeah. somebody who was anything but patriotic, somebody who fought a war simply so they could own people. I mean, how, how would you celebrate that? If it was really about history, what? let's move that statue to a museum. Why does it have to be in public spaces? You have a caller? Yeah, let's do it. Amy, we got a caller. Oh, boy. Let's do it. <laughs> I, I didn't screen this. I don't know. We didn't screen this call. Oh, God. Who do we have here? you live with the Sophisticated Savage. EJ Stewart. Who's this? I think we lost you. We had a crank call. It's a crank call. Take your phone off mute. <laughs> we got a bad, bad service connection. We can't hear you. Is that on our end? No. There is. There is. Shoot. We got cricket wireless. <laughs> cricket right, is going to sue back. you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, allegedly, you got a cricket wire. Or throw you a, or throw you a check. You don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, get your service up. Get cricket or Metro. Get cricket or Metro. But definitely, I mean, um, I definitely appreciate your opinion. But I wanted to get to the feeling because you were talking about as a white person. I don't even because the, the theory of race to me is so um, misused. Mm -hmm. um, it's a false. It's a false pretense. It was developed by Hitler. Oh, the call is back. All right, who we got? <clears throat> who we got here? Yeah, it's Kala. It's that? Kala. Oh, you know. Kala, how you doing, good brother? Yeah. I'm all right. Speak on, brother. I'm good. Man. You know. Uh, yeah, I was trying to figure out how to how to do this and watch it at the same time. If, but you know, if, like if I'm anybody just gonna have else to had a technical you difficulty, you know, it was definitely um, you. I don't know if y'all switched topics, but you know, uh, I'm looking at the the symbolic violence behind those statues. Mm. Uh, you know, it's so you know, sort of like what Franz Fanon was talking about when he was saying that you know the powers that be they will always put up symbols of their power. And they will let you know exactly how they got their power. You know, so when it comes down to the people that are working with the system or what have you, they always will see, uh, you know, like a lot, they will always see those generals. A lot of times you'll see those cannons and you'll see them tanks and you see the, like, like them, them, uh, them guys walking with the flag in the American Revolution and all that type of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, like, they'll always see how power was obtained and how it will maintain and how it will be maintained. Yeah. And when you're talking about France for now, you're talking about the Spaniard or no? no I'm talking about France for now, the, the, the wretched of the earth. Say that again. I'm talking about France for now, the wretched of the earth. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, uh, you know, like, and, uh, you know, he speaks a lot too. He speaks a lot to that, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, those symbols are such a representation of, of violence against, against black people. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, they're like, they're like seeing a cop car. They're like seeing a cop car, um, riding by. You know, they give you that, they give you that feeling, you know what I'm saying? I mean, so EJ, when you're talking about terrorism, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, like, and if we bring terrorism down to what it is, basically, it's inspiring terror in people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't know what, I don't know what you, what y'all have to say to that. No, I, I agree. And that kind of, and I, and I was going to ask Amy and, um, about her feelings, but that kind of speaks to, 
my frustration with Baltimore and the removal of the statute. Now, I want to say again, I commend the the pack the fact that they were proactive to a degree to avoid um, any potential situation around these statues. But the thing is, these statues have been in this city for a long time. And had not these events happened this weekend, I can go out there on a limb and say they wouldn't have removed them. True. And when I when I've taken but my, they needed to they, they needed to long time ago. and and when I'm taking my kids to to the museum we're literally blocks away from where the statues were we are I I, I looked at the statue in amazement because I can I can be amazed and honor the artistic nature of it the massive size of it and the detail and I just looked at the statues and I'm just like wow these were people. And they were soldiers, man. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to take anything away from that because I don't know that these people... Um, treasonous soldiers. They were treasonous sol soldiers. And, and, <laughs> and they the need core, to hold this out because they lost. Yeah. And, and at the core, you know, I respect I respect combat and what it was and what it is. Just just, just being just being glassful, being nice, whatever. And I looked at these statues and it, it gave me chills to say, like, we're not in a Confederate state. What? So Technically. This is definitely the Confederate state. No, no, no. I mean. Maryland is south. Yeah. This, we're, we're, this is the beginning of the south. They seceded. Yeah. They seceded from the Union. I mean, in it, it, it theory. Yeah. Mason-Dixon okay. line. Mason-Dixon line. Dixon line. True. <laughs> um, but, yeah. I mean, we, 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 we had those statues, and it was a massive statue overlooking the museum. Yep. It, it, it boggled my mind, and it pisses me off. And me and Don McKay were saying, this is the fastest thing that we've seen city count. He said ever. Yeah, now, I give it up to him. Move that they, they I give it up done. to Don McKay because he's a Baltimore native, true and true. I'm an implant of over 10 years. But this is the fastest thing that we've ever gotten resolved. Mm -hmm. And it's reactionary. Yeah, it's preventative to anything that happened. 100%. Because you got to understand this. If they didn't take those statues down, let's say that some type of the hipsters, racist movement. The hipsters was you know because the way it normally works is they make this big announcement we're going to take the statues down one day and it's coming and yep. you know it's, it's this big thing how they were able to, to come and just converge on this city if they tried to do that here in baltimore let's say they got four statues here to try to do that here there would be a, a large resistance mm -hmm. among the natives and, and the residents of the city but what it would have would really, gotten would it, violent but it would it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been like listen it wouldn't have been like in, in uh we just saw the weekend these guys here would have it would have been violent it would have been gunfire it would have been people killed and yeah. then the national guard comes and we got this whole other thing and we can't afford and this that. is baltimore so we it's just we don't, yeah we don't they, need anything I don't, like I don't that think, i don't think up there on, on 20 i don't think up there on, on 30 whatever that is i don't think it would have i don't think it would have went down no, like i'm saying that. whatever in baltimore city that the the white racists chose to you think convene the people with the mobilized? tiki torches and all that. Let's just say, let's mobilized? just say that something like that happened. Yeah, yeah, the word would have got out, and it would have, it would have been that would have united the city for I'm that would have united I'm all of the, the criminal they element. Left, they should have left them shits up there. <laughs> no, no, no. But the no, backlash. I, know, I, know, I, I, know, I like I to look at it this way. Backlash. Germany doesn't allow uh, statues of Hitler. Excellent. They, they don't. They not. don't allow flying of the swastika flag. Yeah. So I mean, why should we allow all these things? And, and that's an excellent point anymore. because that's a major fundamental shift. You're talking about a nation who, an entire nation who followed this man. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, there were some people that were, were oppressed. There were, you know, people don't realize that there were Jewish Germans that were oppressed and suffered to the hands of this man, like the, Hitler. Like Hitler, Hitler but, was a Jewish German, right? But the but yeah, the majority yeah. of this of that nation suffered. They built pride, and 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 from a national standpoint, a lot of people didn't agree with everything he was doing. But nationally, it was power. It was money for their nation. And you're talking about years later, they don't even acknowledge that. But here we are, supposedly the most progressive nation mm -hmm. in the world. We have administrative governments and systems and people that wanted to honor these statues. And Baltimore City government, you know, statues were there before Sunday, before Saturday. I think they should be put in a Confederate museum where you can go see them if you want. They shouldn't be out in a public place. That's very nice. Yeah, I think that's, like that. that's, that's very right. nice. But let's keep in mind that there was a movement 
uh, in the 20s, 50s, and the 60s when, when different uh, types of civil rights advances started being made. There were people just like these, these guys and gals who felt threatened by the, the change in things. And they started erecting all of these Confederate memorials, like I said, in the 20s, in the 50s, in the 60s, because there were some uh, uh, white supremacists who were angry about what was happening. Mm -hmm. And th this was to, supposed to remind people, like, right. like the caller said, of, of how things happen and what, and, and this is, don't try to take away, you know, it was that kind of thing. And that's why Absolutely. they were here. But they've been here for so long, some people don't even pay attention. Don't even know they're there. Yeah. Or, you, or, or take the time to read who what it are. says and who the person is. And then you have to historically know who that person is. Yes. And what it means to you. Yes. But that doesn't make it okay. It's definitely not okay. But it's been the status quo for so long. Yeah. And it's good that these things are happening because it's going to change. Yeah. I'm sure there's some in New York, right? I'm sure. Well, at least in the South. I know that yeah, I was going to say, it's South. not a Confederate state. I'd be surprised. Yeah, but, but here's the other thing with New York. Um, I mean, like any other place, when you talk about Central Park, um, that, was a, that was a vibrant black community that they displaced and they created the park. There was also riots and lynchings and racism in the, in the city of New York. Um, so let me ask you a personal question. Did you live in New York during the time when stop and frisk was a huge yes, thing? Yes, I did. Okay, now how many times did it happen to you? I'm just um, <laughs> well, at that time, uh, I lived in Nassau County, which by far um, was arguably at that time more the further east you went, Suffolk County, if you were black, forget about it. Mm -hmm. Nassau County, you might have a chance. New York City, you were getting stopped and frisked. Nassau County, you was getting beat up. Um, and even in New York City, you, you would get stopped, um, frisked, and it became a part of the, the nature of what, what it is. Mm -hmm. It became the nature of everything. And I'll be honest with you, man, and this is why I say these kids a little bit more fearless or dumber than we were because we ran, mm -hmm. you know, and it was a, there was a respect that we had with police officers. It was almost like a game. It was like they were bored. They, run now. they were bored. <laughs> I mean, I think, well, I don't know how they run in the skinny jeans, but, uh, <laughs> you know, they were bored. We yeah. were doing whatever we were doing. They would run after us and we would fight them. And I'll be honest with you, you know, you, you hold your own. They respect you. You know, you walk away, they come back, they do their thing. And it, 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 it was it was societally so accepted, which now that I had the insight, it was wrong. Mm -hmm. But then it was it was like everyday life. It was like, all right, we had one squad car in Nassau County called 107. And it's like when you saw 107, that was the biggest asshole on earth. And it, and it, it seemed like the same guy manned the car. Mm -hmm. Some big Italian dude, Jack, but it was pretty fast. And if he caught you, you got to fight him or don't get caught. Mm -hmm. And but he let you go home. You lived. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean. But even in, um, when I would venture out in the Queens and things like that, they would stop you. Where'd you get that bike from? What's going on? And you know it, it's bad mm -hmm. in the grand scheme of things. But when you're in the moment, you're in the flow. Society and your peers are telling you this is life. Yeah. It's, it's the same way that if a guy asked me what size is my shoes. Yeah, well, you know, Trump, Trump wants to bring back stop and frisk. I already know. And he only wants to bring it back because it was only happening to the black and the brown people. Absolutely. And if it was happening to the white folks, too, suddenly he'd have a different opinion, kind of like the opioid epidemic. Yeah. Now oh, that it's that. happening to white that. people, that. suddenly ahead, it's a national that. epidemic and a you know national emergency. Mm. But it took taking white people down for people to pay attention and to do something about it. Yeah, it, it's a lot of systemic problems. And, you know, I, I, I commend you and your vigor to be publicly as open and outspoken as you are, because I couldn't imagine. OK, I look at it like this. You know, I see black people, black folks doing foul things every day, doing foul shit every day. Mm -hmm. Like, why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, you know, I, I you can get in a position to say, yeah, I want to talk. I want to boast. I want to brag. But I know my people are doing foul shit. Mm -hmm. You're you're out there. You're on your Facebook personally saying my culture, my ethnicity is doing foul shit and I don't like it. Mm -hmm. 
And then you have people that, on the other hand, they might not give you credit for that. They might chastise you for that. They might do or say whatever. I personally want to commend you for continuing to say what the hell you think is right. Well, look, I'll be the first to say that I've benefited from white privilege because I was a bad little kid at once upon a time, but I no. didn't get in the same kind no. of trouble my clients did. No. Because mm. clearly I don't fit the profile. I mean, I mean what, did, what, did, <laughs> what did you I mean, what did you but do? I, I can't say. Okay. Okay. <laughs> let's okay. let's just be honest. Let are me you, just are be you clear. actually saying that if you were black and you did one thing that you did growing up, you would have had a different life? Maybe. Absolutely. That's powerful. Absolutely. I know I got away with stuff because people weren't paying attention to me because I was a little white girl from the suburbs. And, and you know what? That ain't your fault. That ain't your fault. Um, that is not your parents' fault. Your parents did what the hell they were supposed to do. You did what you were afforded to do. And I mean, anybody that can get out of trouble, I would do the same thing. Um, you know, but so it's not, I, I it's not something that. that intentionally happened. It's not something that you know I would then like pull out my white card and use to my advantage. It's just the way it was. But right. I was able to recognize the difference between how I was being treated as a teenager and how my clients are being treated enough to know that it's my job to help them. Well, and, and here's, I mean, we're, we're at nine twelve, but here's the other thing about privilege, right? Um, everybody has privilege. Mm -hmm. Women have privilege. Um, ladies night at the club. You mean? Ladies night. I'm, no, that, I mean, that's privilege. Damn it.